Over the last week, we, oh, let me share this one with you first. Um, Billy tells Jeffy, says, you can learn from your mistakes, so be sure to make some. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, we have talked about kids, last couple of weeks, talked about kids growing in responsibility by uh, being able to have tasks that they handle, being able to blow it, then being able to um, have that empathy and those consequences that become a part of it, and then get in the task again. I just want to let you know that as parents, the same thing happens. You know, it's okay to blow it and just jump in there and do the task again because God's a God of second chances. So just because you blow it doesn't mean that, that you've had fatal mistakes. Remember, there are significant learning opportunities. In fact, I want to tell you about one of those. Um, I told you that love and logic is nothing new. It's been around forever. Uh, the stuff that we're talking about may have some different language attached to it, maybe some different terminologies at times. But the, the actual, the, the philosophy of parenting has always been there. In fact, it, this is probably in 15 years ago. I don't know, do you remember C.C. Rindleman? You don't remember C.C.? C.C., he, about like 15 years ago, went and sang for his funeral. Um, he was, I don't know, probably you know, 78, 80 years old whenever he died. And so the story I'm going to tell you is you take 15 years and you add another, you know, 60 or 70 years to that because of whenever he was a little boy. And he grew up on a farm somewhere. This story was told at his funeral that he and a neighbor kid, and the neighbor kid, of course, lived, you know, probably a quarter mile down the road. Well, they always did stuff together. But this particular day, they got into an argument. And the argument was this, which is stronger? A cow or a donkey? Does anybody know which one is stronger, a cow or a donkey? Yeah, we could take a class pool, you know, see. Stronger No, nah, just <laughs> strength, physical strength. Which one is, is stronger? Well, they couldn't come up with a, a decision either because CeCe's dad raised cows and this neighbor's dad raised donkeys. And so they were each, you know, fighting for their own animal, and they decided they weren't going to get anywhere just talking about it, so they decided to try a little experiment. And so CC went and got one of his dad's cows, and the neighbor kid went and got one of his dad's donkeys, and they brought it out to the pasture, and um, they decided they were going to settle once and for all, which was stronger. Um, the way they decided to do it was to do some tug of war. But rather than put something around their neck or their, you know, muzzle or anything like that to pull, they decide to put the animals back in to back in and tie their tails together. And then each of them, on the count of three, would slap the rump of their respected animal, and they would see which one was stronger. Now, do you want to guess which one was stronger? It was the donkey. And they knew that because as they were pulling, the cow's tail popped off. Oh my gosh. Well, as you can imagine, CeCe's dad was none, none too pleased that he gets home and he looks out there and one of his cows is walking around without a tail. So the, uh, I don't know about the empathy part. You know, we talked about making sure that you start with empathy. I don't know if CeCe's dad started with any empathy or not, but he certainly had a... Uh, creative consequence that went with this because for the next few days CC had to stand out there with that cow and had to swap the flies away from the cow because the cow didn't have a tail anymore to do it for himself for herself see love and logic's been around forever so you know you can learn from your mistakes be sure and, and make some so over the last uh, few weeks, couple of weeks, we've talked about these tools in our toolkit so far. We've talked about steps of responsibility. We just mentioned a minute ago, we talked about SLOs, making those significant learning opportunities, allowing our kids to have those. And the more significant learning opportunities your kids have, the richer and uh, that they're going to be. So give them plenty of those as you possibly can. Talk about empathetic statements. Have you figured out your empathetic statement yet? Now, I know you've got to come up with one. What's your empathetic statement? Nuts. He likes saying nuts. Nuts? Yeah. Hey, you know, remember mine is what? A bummer. Anybody else come up with your empathetic statement? For those of you that, that 
may not remember empathetic statements. Your empathetic statement is, is what you lead into. And if your child has an SLO, you may just, you know, in some instances, whenever they've really blown it, really blown it bad, and they should have known better, that anger and that irritation likes to well up. Well, it's the empathetic statement helps you keep that down. And, and so you have on the tip of your tongue one empathetic statement. How sad. What a bummer. Oh, man. Nuts. Rats. You know, you come up with your own, and you got to be able to do it empathetically. Now, question for you. What do you do if you're not feeling particularly empathetic? I had one parent. She was a mom. And she was just real honest. She says, I don't care. They messed up. I'm mad. I'm not feeling any empathy for them. So what do you do if you're not feeling empathetic? First of all, that mom had some issues herself. But um, well, that's the case where you fake it till you make it. Um, and, and that's why you need to have one, because when something like that happens, you don't need to be fumbling around for the right empathetic statement. God, God, what, am I, what am I supposed to say? I have just one that you use. Oh, man, what a bummer. How sad. What a problem for you. And, and if you need to, you put on little sticky notes and you put it on mirrors or on pictures somewhere where you got on the refrigerator so you can see them during the day. You know, you might have to write it on the top of your hands and you say, oh, man. You, know, you just come up with something, some ways to be able to come up with it. Then you fake it till you make it. I would encourage you make sure that you try to, you know, put yourself in the child's shoes because they are going to have a significant learning opportunity. And, and you need to feel bad for them because it's going to be bad. So... And we talked about empathetic statements. We talked about how to win every argument. Did anyone use, I love you too much to argue? Oh, yeah. Did you? Oh, yeah. How'd he go? <laughs> he kept yelling, so I switched to the other song. Uh, oh, uh oh. Well, I don't remember the other song, but I would basically, yeah, we're going to your room so you can be sweet. There you go. Yeah. Uh oh. And then he, I did the, I can't, I'm not going to talk to you until your voice is calm. Mine, he yelled back, my voice is calm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think we have different definitions of home. Right. Hey, anybody else use? I love you too much to argue. I didn't really use it in those exact words, but like, I'm not going to fight with you about this. How did they go? Pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah. Because it takes two to argue, you know. Mm -hmm. And as long as they don't pull you into the argument, you're good. Yeah. You didn't use it on Josh any this week, did you? No. He's been gone a lot this week. Fortunately, he knows about it. He does know about it, so it's, it's over. <laughs> it's, can't use it anymore. Yeah, I love you too much to argue. It will work with with uh, with your spouse. Um, it'll also work with your boss, except I would change it to I respect you too much to argue. Or I respect myself too much to argue. But that even that gets dangerous. But yeah, once your spouse knows what you're doing, all bets are off. All right. It still works. <laughs> <laughs> I have to use it on Angela all the time. It takes him a while to pick. Oh, did you just love him? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then we got the uh oh song. Remember, when you do it in a song version, instead of just telling them, go get in your room, um, it's a lot easier to kind of keep the anger out. Uh oh, a little bedroom time coming on here. This is so sad. Get back when you can be sweet. Can you print those lyrics out? You need the lyrics, huh? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. you, you need to put those up next to your empathetic statement. Yeah. So that, okay. I haven't heard the song. You haven't heard the song? Sing it again. It's up. Oh, oh, a little bedroom time coming on here. This is so sad. I'm back when you can be sweet. That's, that's, that's it. Okay. That's that's it. Sort of like that one's really cool. Really that's true. That's that's more for preschool, maybe up early elementary. But by the time they, you kind of have to change the words a little bit to something like. I'll be happy to talk to you about this when your voice is as calm as mine. So, I'm not going to argue with you right now. Let's take a time to cool off. We'll come back later. Come back when you can be sweet. I have to tell you a story. I was, I was, I've been working this week filling in at an office. And, um, the dentist and the assistant are right next to my room. And I had a patient in that was not happy. Not happy. And he didn't, he was not going to let me be right. Even though everything was written down. On the computer, what had happened previously, and the assistant was so good. She just kept saying, "No, this is what happened. This is what happened." And he just got louder and louder and louder. She finally went to him. She said, "Yeah, I'm gonna walk out of the room for about five minutes and let you think about it, and then I'll come back." 
And when she walked in, I would say, I said, you know, you handled that just the way when you told me. <laughs> she walked back in there five or ten minutes later, he had calmed down and almost apologized. <laughs> That's so right. On adults. <laughs> That's right. Because remember the Uh-Oh song and that, that sending him to, it's, it's recovery time. It's, it's not punitive. It's not punishment. It's not you go sit in the, the, the chair with your face to the wall and you think about what you did, young man. No, it's, it's recovery time because sometimes kids and adults just need time to regroup and, and to be able to calm themselves, themselves down. That's all this is. So keep practicing those. Make, uh, make, make them something really good. And, and now I've got one, though. Now you might know. The rest of you, I don't want you to look at this because I'm afraid you'll take it seriously. <laughs> Ready? Here we go. <laughs> we did that to my friend in college. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, that's the, that's the red necktie now. Uh oh, that's a lot. We talked last week. Children need limits. That's that's definite. Uh, they know, need to know that their parents are in control at home. That's definite. But can we learn something from the way that God provides limits for us? in order to set those limits for our kids. I want to kind of lay these couple of scriptures on you. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 20. As surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, I know the, the context of the passage is a little bit different than it's not parenting and what Paul is talking about. But I think the principle is still there. How much can we tell our kids yes and that yes also be the no to something rather than always using no? Or how about Colossians 2? He says, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belong to it do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That sort of sounds like a parent. Don't touch that. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't, don't handle that. Stay away from that. Again, different context, but I think the same principle is there. So these are all destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But notice this, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I think that can also be true of our kids, that just using the word no all the time does not get the job done as far as trying to teach them those limits. We've got to, to also give them the yes. We've got to tell them where the limits are and how to live within those limits. And so that's one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight as we ask this question, who is in control at home? Have you thought about who is that? Now, I'm not talking about between uh, the spouse. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about between kids and parents. Who's in control at home? Kid. Kid? <laughs> Just go ahead and be honest with it. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a couple. It goes back and forth. Hmm? It goes back and forth. Does it? Yeah. They want to be in control. They do want to be in control. Just thinking of who sets the calendar. It's kind of the kid. That's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's where you got to. And so how do we get the control back? That's that's the issue. Especially if the kid is in control. And, and it, in, in our culture, in our society, it is easy for the kids to take control. In, in many ways, our society kind of promotes it. But the kids are pretty good at it, too. Went to a, uh, went to a uh, family gathering one time, and I have to tell you about Dustin. I'm going to change the name to protect the guilty. Uh, Dustin was one of those kids that um, he was always bigger than his age, and he was loud, and he would oftentimes... Uh, bully to get his way, and he was just, you know, kind of obnoxious a lot. He's actually grown up to be a pretty good guy, but pretty obnoxious at the time. So he's about four years old, and uh, we're sitting there, and, and I'm watching what's going on, and Dustin is over there, and he wants a particular toy. He wants to play with it, but mom tells him, no, you cannot play with that, and so Dustin, as any kid worth their salt would do, what does he do? Flops down in the floor, starts kicking and screaming, I don't want the toy! I want it! I want it! Well, mom, she leaves the room. 
Okay, so she knows at least to do that. She's going to start throwing a fit. I'm going to leave the room. Well, I'm watching Justin at this point. I want I want it. And I see him open one eye. <laughs> and he looks around, and he doesn't see mom, so he stops. He got up. He went into the kitchen where she had gone, flops down to the floor again. Well, she came over and she's exasperated by now. She's like, she grabs him up, hauls him back into the room where I am. I think, oh, good. Now this is going to get great. This, this is going to be, somebody's going to get a beating. <laughs> she goes over. She grabs the toy. She puts it in his hand. Sits him down and says, there, now will you be quiet? And she leaves the room. He just won that battle. I, mean, I just, I looked at that and so there's Dustin. He's sitting there and he's playing with his toy. And so I leaned over to him, Dustin, Dustin. He said, huh? I said, that worked pretty good for you, didn't it? He looked at me and went, yep. Who's in control? You see me. Now, there is the story of the, uh, we're going to call it Burger Barn. Um, family sitting at Burger Barn. You got mom, you got, you got dad, and you got six year old sitting there. And uh, they've, they've had their burgers for quite a while. And mom and dad are pretty close to being finished with theirs. But you know what the, the boy is doing. You know, he's maybe eaten one bite out of this burger. He's been drawing pictures with his fries, with his ketchup. He's got his little toy from his kids' pack, and he's kind of playing with it at the table. And, and mom's kind of getting irritated because they've got to make it to the store, another store, before it closes. And she said, come on, we got to get to eating because we got to get out of here. And, you know, that really motivates the kid to pick up his burger and start eating. And so she's, so she's starting to, to try to motivate the kid to start eating, and he's not having any of it. He's starting to take his toy and maybe even do little circles in the ketchup with it. Well, Dad, he's getting irritated, too, and he says, can't you do something with that kid? And I always love whenever you hear a dad say something like that. Can't you do something with him? So she decides that she's going to start picking up the hamburger and try to, you know, force feed him. And, of course, that doesn't work any either as well. And and so finally she gives up and they're sitting there and dad's fuming. And then he looks over and the kid kind of gets just a little bit of a grin on his face. And dad said, okay, that's it. We've got to make it to the store before it closes. We're going to leave here. And if you're not finished, we're going to leave you here. And you know what they do whenever kids are left here, they call the cops and the cops take them. You think kid going to buy that one? Now, in both of those stores, who's in control? Kids. Kids will do a really good job of training parents. In fact, we talked about it last week that, you know, these issues come up pretty early in life. We talked about the kid who, who's really small whenever they come into the world and, and they look around them and they can't control anything. And then they suddenly realize that they've got a lot of control because they can control um, how high the pitch mom's voice gets and and they can control the color of dad's face just by doing certain things and they can control whether you see these little little veins pop out of dad's neck you know depending on what they do and they they start using that see there is this science of control that we need to understand that parents need to determine who has control now and understand how to give away a little control and then get a lot back because kids will take that control if we allow them to. Now, we're going to be talking about sharing control. Okay, it just kind of depends one way or the other. We're going to talk about how you share that control. But what we're not talking about is permissive parenting. All right, just lay that out there. We're not talking about permissive parenting. We're not talking about neglectful parenting. What permissive parenting does is it puts the kid on the same level with parents. If there seems to be this idea in some people's minds that kids are much more sophisticated than even we were as kids. And so they're able to make up their minds and able to be in charge of things. And they don't need parents really. They can be on equal level with us when it comes to decision-making and determining their outcomes of life and all that while they're three and four years old. I'm not talking about that. I love that this was in the, the Avalanche Journal several years ago. It said, uh, 
When Corporal Eldon Fuquay was called to a family disturbance involving, quote, an uncontrollable five-year-old, un this, unquote, he was sure someone meant to put a one in front of the five. I couldn't imagine such a thing as an uncontrollable five-year-old, he said. A parent that can't discipline their five-year-old kid is not a parent. But when the child's mother answered the door, she told Fuquay she had called the police because her five-year-old son would not stop watching cartoons and refused to get dressed for school. I was taken aback, Fuquay said. He asked the woman if she had told her child he had to get ready for school. She said she had explained to the boy why he goes to school, but the child refused to budge. Fuquay asked the woman again if she told the child he had to stop watching TV. She said, we do not treat each other that way in this house. It's, and so Fuquay thought, it's like, duh, why would he turn off the TV if he's given a choice between school and cartoons? So Fuquay said he approached the kindergartner who was sitting on his knees, eyes glued on the tube with the remote in one hand. All I said, Fuquay says, is boy, turn off the TV and get dressed now. Well, the boy immediately turned, hit the off button, jumped up, and then ran to get dressed. Fuquay's mother, uh, the, the mother, her reaction? Fuquay said the mother then lambasted the officer for ordering her son around. <laughs> Evidently, she didn't like my methods, he said. I told her not to call me back to her house again. We're not talking about permissive parenting. What we're talking about is how to give away control so we can get a lot back. Now, how many of you would say you have a strong-willed child? Anybody? <laughs> no, we're not talking about strong-willed spouse again. See, I always get kind of confused here. No, strong-willed kid, yeah. What we're gonna be talking about tonight is perfect for the strong-willed child. What you need. So, what do we do? Notice it's Titus 2. I love what Paul says. He says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, how much of a yes statement do you need than God's grace? And so that's that's kind of what we want to help get with uh, with our kids. So, how do we start giving some of that away? Well, let's go back to the burger bar. You know where we were at, six-year-old sitting there, hadn't touched a bite of food, been playing in the ketchup, been playing with his toy, mom's fuming, fuming, dad's fuming, but what if dad were just to stop for just a moment, and the first thing he's got to do is he's got to say something that's going to calm him down. And so he may say something like, no problem. See, whenever you're, 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 you feel your anger getting up, start off with something like that. It's kind of like the empathetic statement, oh man, and, and you could start with the empathetic statement, oh man, oh, this is such a problem. But you may say, oh, no problem. And I tell you what will happen is if you'll start with that whenever you're dealing with your kids in really difficult situations, then what they will learn is whenever they hear those words, no problem, especially if they're nice and calm, you know, no problem, then they quickly learn that not a problem for me, but it could be for you here in just a minute. So you're going to start with something that's going to calm you down. No problem. And then you're going to go next to those things you can control. Because would you agree that there are just some things you cannot control with your kids? What are some things you cannot control with your kids? When they go to the bathroom. They eat. Man, oh man, our son... He was determined he was not going to learn how to go to the bathroom by himself until he was in high school. Until that day that he decided, this is what I'll do. I think it had something to do with big boy pants or something. No, he didn't want those. He didn't want those. I would have bought him anything in the world. <laughs> we, he didn't we're, want anything. We're going to bribe him. You know, Angela was, was a stay-at-home mom at that time, and I'd come home and her, her first statement as I walked through the door would always be, Tag, he's yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else can you not control? Can't control where they're going to eat. We'd like to, 
By the way, I've never known of a kid who is normal to starve themselves. So it's all right. Can't control that. You can't control muscular movements. Do you notice that? In fact, if you want to see if you can control your kid, use one of these statements. Hurry up. What happens when you tell a child to hurry up? They slow down. Uh, come. Really slow it down. You can't control what they're going to think. You can't control, you know, oftentimes what they're going to say. So there's so much you can't control. And so here, the six-year-old sitting at the table, dad says, no problem. And so what the dad's got to do is he's got to start with something he can control. Now what? We got to get to the store. So we're going to leave. The car is going to leave in five minutes. Just thought I'd let you know. And just leave it there. Now, what did the dad just do for the kid? Gave him a warning. Gave him a time limit. Put the ball in his court. He did. He put control in the child's place. Now, what does the child have to decide? Are you going to eat or are you not going to eat? Are you going to leave here full or are you going to leave here hungry? In fact, if you do it right, the kid's mind will be swimming with so many choices that they've got to pick through. In fact, that's pretty good for the kid because now you said five minutes, then the parents don't have to. Remember what we said earlier? You give a child a task that they can handle. We're going to leave in five minutes. Then you hope they blow it. See, the dad at this point ought to be hoping that the kid doesn't eat anything. And you, you know why you do that? Remember what we said about that? Because that way it saves us from the reminder trap. When that for the next five minutes, every 30 seconds, hey, uh, it's four and a half minutes now. No, I told you it's two, two minutes away. Now see, we've already told him five minutes. It's all in his court now. But that's a hard part. A lot of people get in that reminder trap. It is, yeah. Because they're worried because the kid's not eating and then get worried. Okay, three minutes, three minutes, and then they start, then it ruins everything. And we don't want our kid to suffer. We don't want our kid to hurt. And that's all right. There's a lot of loving parents out there that they don't want their kids to hurt. And I understand that. But they're also robbing their kids of all sorts of valuable lessons they could be learning. We're going to give as much of that control away as we can. And so when parents understand this, they can start offering choices. And what they wind up doing is they wind up having control on their terms. You're going to share as much control as you can so that you have control, but it's on your terms. See, here, here's the, the, the fact of the matter. Um, there are these control battles that we like to get into. You're going to talk this way. You're going to think this way. In fact, if, if you don't know this yet, and those of you with kids that have reached like early preteen and older, they get to this new way of thinking where they can think about thinking and what they're thinking. And they will say things that they don't really agree with, but they know it'll make mom and dad crumble. Did you ever do that to your parents? Oh, yeah. It was fun. You know, you just argue because it's fun. You know. Well, you can't control what they think, and, and they know that. And so what happens with this is when we share control we get our share back. But if we try to hoard all the control, then we soon lose it all. In fact, what our kids will do is they will, we either give up that control or kids will take it away from us. It's kind of like if they were leading us around on a leash. And if they think that they're losing control, they start pulling on that leash. Let me tell you about a little girl that Angela had her kindergarten class one year, but the parents came in at the beginning of the year and said, we need your help. Oh, we need your help. Anytime a kindergarten parent comes in and tells a kindergarten teacher, we need your help this year, that, that is enough to cause a kindergarten teacher's spine to turn to liquid and just, oh no, here we go. They said, yeah, we can't get her to do anything. She, she, she just does whatever she wants to do. We can't get her to do anything. So I just started asking questions about 
you know, what they had tried. And they said, we tried everything. We tried taking things away from her. And so we started taking things out of her room. And she, they said, we are all the way down to, uh, she only has a mattress in her room. That's it. No bed. She just got a mattress sitting in her floor. And she still doesn't do anything. So Angela decided she talked to them about how to share control. And so let's go back to the burger barn and, and see what this looks like. How do you gain the control? Rule number one, never take any more control than you absolutely have to. And that way you always leave the kid responsible with a little piece of the action. Give the kid as much control as possible can so that you give them a piece of the action. Now, what it's called is putting the kids in control, but it's going to be on your terms. Remember, we're not going to be permissive. We're not just going to relinquish all control. We're going to put it on our terms. It's called offering choices within limits. Let me show you this one. Um, what are my choices for dinner tonight? Uh, Dag would ask Blondie. Well, she says, you can take me out to dinner or I can take you out to dinner. So he says, it's always nice to have a choice. Tonight's technique sounds too simple. It really does. And you, you may go out of here and say, oh, that was dumb. That, what, no, this isn't going to work. Let me tell you, if you'll give this one a shot, you will be amazed at what may happen with your kids. We're gonna offer choices within limits. And here's the important thing. I'm always gonna provide two alternatives, either of which will make me deliriously happy. Now that's key. I'm gonna offer two choices, only two, all right? Some of you say, well, can I offer three? Can I offer four? No, just give two. I mean, that's, that's enough. Offer two choices, either of which are gonna make you deliriously happy. See, we sometimes wind up getting into these choices where one of them's not going to make us happy. Would you like to have carrots for supper or M&Ms? You pick. Which one's the kid going to pick? There you pick the M&Ms. And that's really not what you wanted them to pick. Don't, don't offer choices that you don't like. In fact, if you wind up starting to give kids choices that, that you don't like, you know which one they're going to pick. The one you don't like. So you're going to pick two choices that make you deliriously happy. And what you may find is you want the kid to get from point A to point B, but there's gonna be several different ways that they can get from point A to point B. It doesn't have to just be one. See, somewhere along the way, we as parents, and especially we as dads, got this idea that if we're gonna be successful, we've gotta have a thumb on our kids all the time, and we've gotta tell them what to do, and they've gotta jump whenever we tell them to jump, when they gotta ask how high, and if, if they're not doing exactly what we tell them to do, we have failed in some way. What I'm telling you is you're setting yourself up for these control battles that we as parents can't win. We talked about some of the things we can't control in our kids. And it may look like it. We can control them while they're at the house. But what do they do whenever they get out of the house? I'll show you. So, we're going to give some choices. Um, now, what happens if they offer a third choice? You can have peas or carrots. Oh, I, I wanted, I wanted, uh, I, 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 I wanted potatoes. Now, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. And, and you just one line, remember, I love you too much to argue. We're not going to argue about peas, carrots, or potatoes. We, I gave you two choices, and so it's just going to look like this. Um, would you like peas or carrots tonight? I want potatoes. What were the choices? But I really like potatoes. Well, what were the choices? But, but we had carrots the other night. What were the choices? And all you do is just go into the what were the choices? What were the choices? What were the choices? Now, some kids will learn pretty quickly that whenever you give two choices, those are your two choices, and then they'll go ahead and make one of the choices. But what if they refuse to choose? Exactly. See, there's an implied third choice. 
The implied third choice, and you don't have to say it, but the implied third choice is if you don't decide within a certain amount of time, and that's not going to be a long time, it, it could be five or 10 seconds. If you don't decide within a certain amount of time, I get to choose. And so it sounds something like, what were the choices? Well, I don't like either one of those. It's okay, I guess we'll have carrots tonight. I'll tell you what, I'll give you another chance to choose later on. You're going to keep the smile on your face, going to keep calm, your, your voice calm. But yeah, and, and pretty soon they're going to figure out if I don't take a choice, mom or dad's going to pick for me. And so I'm, if I really want a choice, I'm going to take it now. Kind of like uh, this mom. She says, which sweater do you want today? April, the red one or the blue one? The blue one, the blue one. Then mom says, and which hat? The one with the stars or the one with the bunnies? Bunny hat. Now, what would you like to put on first? Your boots or your raincoat? She says, boots first. What happens next? She says, I've been tricked. Hmm. The goal is to share that control, especially with strong-willed kids. So let me tell you about the little girl. Angel Tone says, it sounds like she, she needs to have some control around the house. Mom and dad looked at her and said, what? That's all she does is control at the house. And no, no, yo, yo. she needs to have a, a, a bit more control. She said, I'll tell you what, instead of telling her what to do, start giving her some choices. You want to do this? You want to do that? This or that? This, this, was a, this is one of the strongest willed children that Angel had ever seen. And so she told the parents, see how many choices you can get because strong-willed children live on choices. Well, the parents went home and they experimented. I told you, just start with it as some experiments. You know, sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. That's all right. Um, and so she, they went home and they started offering these choices. They said by Christmas time, Everything that had come out of her room was back in the room. And things were so much more peaceful in the house because they started offering choices. We're at the burger barn. Five minutes has passed. The kid still has not touched a bite of hamburger. Well, now mom and dad have to decide what to do. Um, now, one thing that's not an option is that they will stick around a little bit longer and try to get the kid to eat. They said five minutes, five minutes is up. Well, looks like it's time to go, let's go. Now the kid, he's not gonna take that land down. He's too good for that. So he looks up and says, but I'm not finished eating yet. What does the parent say? It's time to go. Nope, nope, nope. You weren't here though, so you get a pass. Oh. What's the first thing out of your mouth? Sorry. You lead with the empathy, then you go with the consequence. Oh man, look at that. My car is leaving. Now's a good time to start offering some choices, isn't it? Would you like to uh, take your food home and eat it later? Or you want to leave it here? Do you want to take it in a bag or do you want to just carry it with your hands? Uh, do you want to stuff it in your pocket? Well, that might not make mom deliriously happy, but yeah, you start coming up with choices. Uh, well, the kid's not going to take that, are they? So, no, I want to eat. I, I haven't had it. I'm hungry. Time for some more choices. Well, would you like to walk under your own power or you want me to carry you? <laughs> now, any kid that's a strong little kid, things are going to get kind of active about now, aren't they? I mean, there's going to be a little bit of screaming. People in the restaurant are going to be looking over and seeing what's going on. Now, by the way, whenever people start turning and looking to, at you as a parent, you know what you're thinking. They're, they're thinking, don't you? It's not what lousy parents. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, glad that's not my kid. Yeah. <laughs> we've got to start, we've got to stop being so concerned about what other parents think of us and be more concerned with what we're doing with our kids, especially in public places. That's right. And so you ask the kid, you're going to walk on your own, or you're going to be carried. And you know, more than likely, the kid's not going to make a choice, and so the implied third choice. All right, scoop them up. Here we go, and carrying them, screaming all the way out. Now for those choices along the way. They get in the car. They start down the road. 
they hear the kid in the back seat say something really brilliant, like, I guess I'll eat, have to eat my hamburger next time. Let me let you hear about Jake. Jake is one of those strong-willed teenagers we were talk, talking about. Oh, I got to go back because I forgot to turn the speaker on. I want to make sure you hear it. Here we go. I was a big strong-willed kid. I was a big teenager. It won't even get up. Oh, man. Jake was such a kid. Jake was a classic strong-willed child. If you said yes, he'd say no. Try to figure out what other people wanted so he could do exactly the... Now, does do these ideas work with strong-willed teenagers? Oh, perfect fit. Do strong-willed people love control? Oh, that's the diet of choice, right? Give me some more of that good stuff. What happens when you tell a strong-willed kid what to do? A little buzzer goes off. Beep, 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 beep. Control loss, warning. Then a little menu pops up. Options for regaining control. Option A, hearing loss. Option B, muscular paralysis. Option C, do exactly the opposite of what they want. Well, Jake, he liked school, but he was completely dependent on his parents to nag him out of bed, nag him to eat, nag him to do everything. Well, his parents sat him down one night and started giving choices. Gotta apologize to you, Jake. Nagging you too much. You want us to nag you or not nag you? I'm tired of that nagging. You want us to treat you like an adult or like a little kid? Adult, man, I'm 14 now. Okay. Um, well, then you gotta make a lot of choices. Are you going to be setting your alarm clock for 6.30 or 6.45? What would be best for you? Ooh. Okay, you can decide about that. And are you going to be setting your alarm clock right next to your bed, or do you think it'd be smarter to have it over there across the room so it wakes you up? You have to get up and walk a little bit, get you woke up. Ooh. What happens if the kid just says, I don't know? Is it still working? Yeah. Yes. Well, hey, you got to make some other choices. Are you going to eat breakfast at home, or are you just going to wait for lunch or get something from one of your friends or whatever? You know, you just decide about that. And hey, you going to remember your homework, or are you going to just. Explain to your teacher why you don't have it. All right? Because we're going to love you regardless of the number of years it takes you to get through middle school. <laughs> and, uh, Jake, uh, hold on a second. I think there's probably some other. Hey, are you going to get up on time and catch the bus, or are you going to be paying somebody to take you? Uh, you have to decide about all. Oh, oh, God, enough with this stuff. Quit. You're nagging now. We're nagging with the choices? Yeah, that's nagging. Well, do you want us to stop or continue? That night they went to bed. Now, here's a quiz for you. What are they hoping for? Oh, hoping and praying he's going to sleep through that alarm. Are they disappointed? No, he walks out the next morning. Only problem is it's about 10 o'clock. Who's sitting at the table? Mabel. Uh, she gets around, doesn't she? Yeah, Mabel is anybody you can get your hands on. Sometimes it's best that they're not loving logic, too. You kind of want somebody that looks at the kid and says, I have to be here. How are you going to pay me? <laughs> well, I'm staying around. You can't make me stay here. No problem. See, I'm here to supervise the house since you're staying home. And, you know, if you help me supervise, it's going to only charge you five bucks an hour. But if I have to do it on my own, then it'll be ten. So you decide. Was that night pretty interesting? How could you do that? What did they come up with? A little variant on that one one liner. Love you too much to nag you. But I ain't slept through and you wake me up. Love you too much to nag you. But how could you do that? I, I was late for school. Nag, love you too much to nag you. How'd you get to school? That mean that way charged me five bucks. Ooh, why didn't you take a taxi or something? Oh, you're doing more. I hate this. Love you too much. Now, did he learn anything long term from this? Parents weren't sure. Mom went in his room the next day when he was at school. There was only one change. The alarm clock was as far away from his bed as it could be physically put. 
Are we getting somewhere with this kid? How many different options could you, how many choices can you give during the day? You may have to get a little bit creative sometimes. Just stop before you, before you actually tell your kid, do this, stop for a minute and see how many options, how can I change this into a choice? Do this or do this. Um, our son, he, he was the one that we had to really use choices with. I mean, it, it's either the strong-willed kids, but there is this other version of strong-willed kids that don't always argue with you. Instead, they become very passive-aggressive. Did you ever notice that? And, and Matthew was a very quiet kind of strong-willed kid most of the time. And uh, there's, there's several of these techniques that um, were fun to experiment with on him. But um, he, he, was, he was one that, well, you know, whenever it's cold outside, does, does it help to tell your child wear your coat? Kids hate to wear their coats for some reason. I mean, I kind of hate wearing a coat sometimes too until I got older. And now I, I like having a coat. Well, Matthew was one that would tell him, get your coat on, and we'd get out in the car and no coat. So what we learned was, okay, remember, try to offer choices, try to offer choices. And so one day, Angela says, would you rather wear your coat or carry it? He went over, picked up his coat, walked out to the car with it. After you got in the car, it's cold, so we put it on real quick. How can you change a direction into a choice? Because the goal is we're giving a piece of the action to the kids and doing it on our terms. So the handout that I, I, I have for you tonight, it gives a few other examples of some choices you can give. Would you like to wear your coat or carry it? How about, are you going to clean the garage or mow the yard this week? Let, let them have a choice there. Will you have these choice, chores done tomorrow or do you need an extra day to get them finished? Are we going to have peas or, or as your vegetable? Peas or peas? No, 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 I'm not talking well now. Are you going to have peas or carrots as your vegetable tonight? Are you going to bed now? Or would you like to wait 15 minutes? Uh, can you stay with us and stop that? Or do you need to leave for a while and come back when you're sweet? Are you going to put your pajamas on first or brush your teeth first? Will you be home at 10 o'clock or do you need an extra half hour with your kids or with your friends? Are you guys going to stop bickering or would you rather pay me for having to listen to it? I have as many choices along the way that you can. The, the goal on this one tonight is to, um, to try to come up with those choices. Now, how young, how young? I mean, can you do choices with one that's young back here? Yeah. The, the rule of thumb that we learned last week, as soon as the kid can start spitting the beats, they can learn from consequences. They can learn from choices. But it may sound just a little bit different. Um, I know that one of the, the ladies here, the way she always put it, she said that if her kids started spitting the beats or started throwing things off of the high chair, you know, then what she would do, she had a one line that she would say. She would say, uh, food up, baby down. Food up, she'd take the plate and she'd put it on the cabinet, baby down, she'd take the baby and put them on the floor. That's all she said. And so what the child learned real quick was, when I start throwing the food, that means I'm making the choice I'm not eating anymore. And I'm getting down on the floor. And so the baby learns pretty quickly, if I'm going to be hungry, I need to go ahead and keep the food on my plate. Now, it may take two or three times for the baby to finally figure out that's what the choices are. But there they are. Um, do this with clothes. I know of parents who still pick out their kids' clothes when they are like middle school years. What's that? <laughs> now, I know some moms are just horrified because of some of the clothes that their kids will pick out if they give them the choice. So if you want a choice that's making you deliriously happy, what do you do? Yeah, this shirt, this shirt. These pants, these pants. Now, if you want to make it deliriously happy, you want to make sure that they match. You know? And then they get to the point where they can make those choices. Let me tell you why this is important. Um, so I told you there's three guys that really have kind of carried love and logic through. There's the two older guys, Foster Klein and Charles Faye. Charles Faye, uh, Charles's son, 
no, Jim Fay. Jim Fay's son is Charles. Okay, so it's Jim Fay and Foster Klein. Jim's son, Charles. Um, Charles? Did I get that right? Yeah. He uh, he had a lot of love and logic used on him. And so whenever he got to be an adult, he became a child psychologist. He kind of entered the business with dad. And he's, he's the one that told the story just a minute ago. Well, back whenever Charles was, uh, or Charlie at the time, was in high school, um, he had come to his dad and said, Dad, now they lived in the Denver area. Um, and so Charles comes to him and says, Dad, Dad, there is this great party this weekend. I, I just got to go to it. It is, I mean, everybody's going to be there. All my friends are going to be there. I got to go. Can I borrow the car? Well, Jim said, well, I, I think, let me check with your mom, because one of the cars was in the shop. They only had one car between them. And uh, he checked with mom and said, oh, I'm sorry, son. Um, the car, she's got to have the car that night. Um, there, there's just, why don't you call your best friend? Call Nathan. N Nathan, maybe he can take you. And Charles said, no, that's all right. I'll, uh, I'll just go to the next one. It's not that, not that big a deal. He turned around and went to his room. Jim's just kind of sat there dumbfounded. He said, wait a minute, this, this, this can't go. First of all, it was the biggest party of the year, and now it's no big deal. So we went into Charles's room. And he said, Charlie, tell me, what, what's going on here? You, you, you decided you don't want to go to the party after you said you couldn't have the car? He said, no, Dad, it's all right. Don't worry about it. I, let's don't talk about it. And, and the dad said, no, really, you got to tell me what's, what's going on. He said, well, he said, I, I didn't want to talk to you about it because I know how much you think of, of Nathan. And he really is a good guy. He said, but when we go to parties like this, um, he's one of those kids that likes to put stuff in the drinks and stuff. And he has a little bit too much to drink. And I just, I don't, I don't want to get in the car with him after the party. Jim said, oh, okay. Thanks. I, I appreciate you letting me know. And then they dropped it. The next morning, Jim pulls out the newspaper and there's the front page. There's a picture of a car that's a mangled mess. And the story reads that five teenagers were in the car coming back from a party the night before. And they had too much to drink and they had driven off the side of one of those mountain roads as they were coming back from the party. And all five kids were killed. And he looked at the name and the driver was Nathan. He said it was at that moment he realized that his son was one decision away from a life and death situation. See, what we want to do is we want to give our kids as many opportunities to experience the real world while they're at home and the price is cheap so that when they get older and they're making bigger decisions, they know how to do it. I know way too many kids who are now adults you know, you know those adults that they're paralyzed to make a decision? They just can't make decisions in life. And some of that may have been because they weren't given the opportunity to try out making decisions all along the way. So do your kids a favor. Start offering just little choices. Don't have to be big things. Just little things. As many of them as you can during the day. And see how that builds up their confidence in being able to make choices. So that is your assignment this week. Determine who is exercising control at your house from moment to moment and find, find opportunities to share control by giving choices this week. And when we get back together next week, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, some of the rules for offering choices. We'll kind of narrow it down a little bit more and give a little bit more guidelines about how to offer some of those choices. And next week, and this is the favorite for, for several, especially as the kids get older, we're actually, remember, Love and Logic seeks to raise our kids without anger, lecture, or threats. All right, no more anger, no more lecture, no more threats. But I'm going to tell you a, a technique next week where you can actually give a lecture to your child and get away with it, <laughs> where they actually listen to you. All right, so that's next week. But this week, start offering as many of those little choices as you can. Come back next week. Let me know how that went. I'll have a few more stories for you next week of some parents here that started offering some of those choices, and we'll start putting our heads together on that.